So the OnePlus 11 5G has been out for a couple of months now, and I've been using it as my main device so I can get a real feel for it and exactly what it has to offer. I've got to say, this is one of the most underrated phones out there right now, and having recently reviewed three flagships in the iPhone 14 Pro Max, the Galaxy S23 Ultra and the Pixel 7 Pro, it's made me realise just how good value this phone is. It really feels like OnePlus is back, and that this is the return of the flagship killer. So today we're going to cover the build, the display, performance, cameras and more, and I'll explain why I think this is one of the most underrated phones in 2023. I've put a short out already with the full unboxing, so we'll start off with the design, which for me personally is a mixed bag. From the front it's not too bad, the bezels are relatively thin, albeit not symmetrical, and I'd personally rather have a centrally placed hole punch, but otherwise this looks pretty good. On the back we get a rather slippery glossy finish with this nice eternal green colour, but the standout feature is this camera bump, which I've gotta say I'm not a huge fan of. I prefer the square OnePlus 10 design myself, or better still, the lens only approach that Samsung takes. It's easy to turn this design polarising, but I think that's just being polite because I'm yet to hear a single person say that this is their favourite looking smartphone. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong though. The appearance is less important than the practical aspect, which is actually very good here. This is one of the few big phones that actually feels really thin and still premium quality, but without being too heavy. The rounded corners and sides feel nice in the hand as well, though there is a curve to the front glass, which on occasion has given some accidental touch issues, but it's not a deal breaker. OnePlus helpfully separates the volume and power buttons across either side, and best of all, the alert slider is back. Nothing beats the convenience or how satisfying it is to instantly click the slider into silent, vibrate or ring mode, and every phone should have this. The OnePlus 11 also has fantastic haptics, maybe even the best out there. You can now change the type and intensity of them, choosing between the more precise crisp, which are my favourite, or gentle, which are softer and deeper, like on the Pixel. The phone uses Gorilla Glass Victus on the front and 5 for the back with an aluminium frame, so that's pretty standard, but one thing I really like is the pre-applied film screen protector. So few phone companies do this, it barely adds any thickness to the screen, it's pre-applied and therefore bubble free and perfectly installed, and is excellent for preventing those minor scratches you inevitably pick up in your pocket. You can see my screen has already been saved from a few of those, and actually I've gone completely caseless since launch and this has held up, not perfectly, but very well so far. It's also IP64 protected, so it's nice to finally get an official protection rating from OnePlus, but this is quite a way behind the competition. Most allow for full submersion underwater, and not just the flagships either, whereas this is only protected against light splashes. It might seem like a small thing, but you'll need to be more careful with this phone, and not even having to think about this is a luxury I've come to enjoy and somewhat expect in other phones. To be honest, it's probably my biggest reason to avoid recommending this phone to people, so make sure you're aware before buying that you'll need to handle it carefully. Now let's talk display specs. This is a 6.7 inch LTPO OLED, which means it can dynamically change the refresh rate up to 120Hz and all the way down to 1Hz. It's also a Quad HD Plus display supporting Dolby Vision and a peak brightness of 1300 nits. So those are clearly flagship level specs, the colours are excellent and I've been especially pleased with how smooth the navigation is. That's definitely a highlight. It's not perfect though, because the variable refresh rate isn't always consistent, and with Instagram especially, I noticed it fluctuated between smooth and stuttering. The brightness is perhaps the one thing that's noticeably behind phones like the S23 Ultra, but it's still readable in bright sunlight and looks great indoors. For biometrics, we have a simple face unlock as well as an optical fingerprint scanner. Now this works really quickly, has great animations, and has been super reliable so far. I can only remember one or two failed attempts actually. The only slight annoyance is, recently, I'll often be prompted to enter my passcode and need to swipe up to get back to the fingerprint. So whether you're using this for simple social media browsing, or even for watching HDR movies, this is a really nice display. The stereo speakers though, even with Dolby Atmos, leave a little to be desired. They're not bad and can get reasonably loud, but there are plenty of other phones with better speakers, in particular with the bass response. What I'd recommend instead is pairing the phone with some Bluetooth earbuds, and more specifically, the new OnePlus Buds Pro 2. I said I'd talk about these because although they missed out in this year's earbuds awards, they're definitely a great sounding pair of earbuds that are best paired with a OnePlus 11. 
Doing so would unlock OnePlus's head tracking spatial audio feature, for instance, something I'm normally not a huge fan of, but it actually works really well here. You can get high res audio through LHDC, a codec the OnePlus 11 supports, and if you enable golden tuning and use the personalized sound tuning feature, they can sound fantastic. Crisp and detailed highs, but also a full bodied, warm and deep bass response. I find myself coming back to these often with my OnePlus 11 purely for the sound quality. The overall feature set is well rounded though, with Google Fast Pair, Multipoint, a low latency game mode, and an IP55 protection rating, and even IPX4 for the case. You'll also get an impressive 9 hour battery on a single charge, a compact case with wireless charging support, and design wise, I think these look great and they're easily comfortable enough to wear for hours at a time. The only potential weakness is the ANC, which I'd class as good, but there are now plenty of earbuds that would go into the very good or higher categories. The microphone quality is also fairly decent, not that you should buy these specifically for the mic, but if you did need to take a phone call then these should serve you well enough in most situations. So if you end up buying a OnePlus 11, you should definitely check these out as well, because I can easily recommend picking up a pair to go with it. Let's talk now about performance. Easily a strength for the OnePlus 11, which is rocking a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chip and comes in either an 8 or 16GB of RAM model. I would definitely recommend spending what's only $100 more for that higher RAM version. It does also come with double the storage as well at 256GB, but that extra RAM will be really nice in boosting particularly the multitasking capabilities of this phone, which I've found to be really good so far. Looking at the benchmarks, you can see we're getting impressive numbers across the board, and this highlights the significant step up from previous OnePlus entries. This phone slots right into that flagship area ahead of phones like the Pixel 7 Pro, but not quite at the market leading levels set by the S23 Ultra. So this is a very fast and capable phone, including for gaming, that's essentially on par with other leading flagships. You'd really have to nitpick to spot any differences from the best. OnePlus seems keen to highlight their new advanced cooling system, and whilst it's hard to say how much this is contributing to the performance exactly, the numbers and certainly the experience speak for themselves. The phone does still get warm to the touch, and the stability results from stress testing weren't exactly outstanding, but as long as the performance remains this solid, I've got no complaints. The experience feels fast and reliable, not just because of the chipset, but also a combination of that high refresh rate and the fluid Oxygen OS 13 software. Now the die-hard OnePlus fans may not like the departure from the cleaner and sleeker Oxygen OS of the past, and what you're actually getting here is more of a colour OS experience, but to me it doesn't feel like those new additions clutter or spoil the experience, and I actually quite enjoyed some of them. Those haptic customizations, for instance are new this year, the bloat is kept very minimal, and yet we still have a really nice amount of customization. Simple things like being able to organise the app drawer actually improve on the Pixel's Android experience, which many, including myself, consider to be the Android template. One thing I don't especially like though is the need to double swipe, or at least purposefully long swipe to dismiss notifications. I don't think there's any need to mess with the single swipe, a staple Android gesture. So with these software changes, I do understand the argument that we've now lost a reason to specifically go for a OnePlus phone. It's now pretty much only the alert slider offering a unique edge but I still personally really enjoy the overall software experience and don't really consider this a negative. Perhaps the best part about the software though is how well the phone is going to be supported. OnePlus is promising 4 years of updates and 5 for security, so that's flagship level support that not only provides future proofing for the device, but also a real incentive to buy it over the competition. So what about the battery life? Well this is also at a flagship level, comfortably making it through a full day even with moderate to heavy use. You can see from my typical usage I'm getting 4.5 hours of screen on time, but I've been able to push this up close to 8 hours on a single charge with more intense use as well. For context, this is a slight improvement over the OnePlus 10 Pro, and against current flagships it annihilates the Pixel 7 Pro, but does trail behind market leaders in the 14 Pro Max and the S23 Ultra. But where it obliterates that competition is in the charging speed. OnePlus absolutely deliver on their promise of charging from 0 to 100% in just 25 minutes. For most of us in the West, we've not yet seen insane charging speeds like this, and it's honestly pretty awesome to witness. I probably won't charge this way all the time just to preserve my battery health, but if you are ever caught out and need a quick top up, this is such a useful feature to have with your phone. I also like that OnePlus include the 100W power adapter, along with their signature red charging cable, in the box with the phone. Normally I'd advocate for not including another wasteful adapter, but since this is the proprietary one needed for those crazy charging speeds, it's actually cool that OnePlus doesn't charge extra to make you buy this separately. There is one catch though, and that's that we still don't have wireless charging. Now for some of you, this will be no big deal, but I must admit that I do miss having the convenience of wireless charging. Still, the blistering speeds I get with the cable goes a long way in offsetting my disappointment, so it's a trade-off I can accept. 
Now let's talk about the cameras. We've got a 50 megapixel main lens, a new 32 megapixel tele lens, and a 48 megapixel ultra wide. But the main talking point is the collaboration with Hasselblad, in particular for the color science. You can see that design language in the camera app, for instance with this orange shutter button in photo mode. But how does the processing actually affect image quality? Well, the first thing that struck me is that you can get some really nice looking photos from this camera. Images are sharp, high in saturation, and typically have a warm color temperature that gives them a more stylized look. So photos are visually striking, vivid, and very pleasing to the eye, albeit not always as natural looking as some of the competition. With the ultra wide lens, images are again very sharp, but the contrast and saturation really ramps up, so the consistency between lenses isn't really a strong point. There were inconsistencies with the new tele lens as well, and whilst it can produce some nice looking shots, it is a shame that it's only a 2x optical lens. The phone does consequently struggle as you extend the zoom up towards the maximum at 20x, and if you compare against a phone with a superior optical zoom range, you can then see the difference quite clearly. But unless ultra long zooms are your priority, there should still be plenty enough range offered here. There's also a macro mode which enables automatically when you're close to a subject, and these look pretty good too, but did lack slightly in sharpness. The phone does a good job in low light situations too, offering decent exposure with very little noise, and nighttime photos usually offer a really good amount of detail. There is also a tripod mode for taking longer exposures in those extreme low light situations. I think the main camera weakness is with the dynamic range. Bright areas can sometimes be overexposed leading to clipped highlights, and then shadows that should be dark are overly brightened. So this can reveal more detail and again adds to this stylized look for photos. But if you compare against the Pixel 7 Pro, the phone generally considered to have the most accurate camera right now, you can see the huge difference in the image processing. So it's a look that I'm sure lots of people might enjoy, but I'd say don't expect to always capture a true reflection of the real life scene. Video quality was pretty good, we get up to 8K24 thanks to that high-end processor, but your best results as usual come with 4K. At 60fps video is very smooth, which you can't really tell here in this 25fps YouTube video, but the colours are nicely saturated, the image is sharp, and the overall video quality is very pleasing. Sadly, that's absolutely not the case with the front camera. Okay, so I'm filming now with the OnePlus 11 and also an iPhone 14 and the Pixel 7 Pro. Mainly just to give you some context for the video and sound quality, these phones are roughly the same price so they should serve as viable alternatives. Now for me, the OnePlus is at a massive disadvantage because it can only film in 1080p and 30 frames per second. Most phones, including these two, can film in 4K and 60 frames per second. But let me know what you guys think, which one has the best front-facing video? For me, that was a no-brainer, and the OnePlus was the poorest by far. And because of that relatively low-quality front lens, you can expect only average selfie results at best. You can see they're smooth, lacking in detail, and the colours are shifted towards warmer red tones. The portrait effect was actually fine, but obviously is still affected by those drawbacks. And one thing I especially dislike is how the corner placement for the selfie lens gives an unusual angle that can be hard to compensate for. So the front camera definitely lets this phone down, and is nowhere near the quality level of the rear camera. Overall though, the OnePlus 11 camera system is quite capable and should be more than good enough for most people. If you're the sort of person that buys a phone specifically for the camera, this one probably isn't for you, and it lacks the accuracy of the Pixel, the video capabilities of an iPhone, and the versatility of the S23 Ultra. But certainly for the price and where the front camera is less important, I think most people are still going to be happy. Ok, so having looked at all of the main features, it's pretty obvious that this is a good phone, but the reason this is actually a great phone is the price. Starting at just $699, this is one of the cheapest phones running the lightning fast Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset, and that immediately gives this phone excellent value for money, especially if you can get a pair of OnePlus Buds Pro 2 bundled in with it for free. It's kind of crazy when you think that the Galaxy S23 Ultra is almost twice as expensive. Yes, the Ultra is a better overall device, and yes, I do think you should consider the OnePlus 11 as a $799 phone and go for the higher RAM model. But when you consider what most people want from a phone, I really think this compromises in all the right places, and it easily wins in terms of value for money. This is a phone that's really well positioned in the market right now, and feels a bit more like the OnePlus we used to know. They've earned back their flagship killer status. Against previous devices, this is considerably more capable than the OnePlus 10T, but it does make for a tough choice between this and a now discounted OnePlus 10 Pro. Personally, I think the performance gains do justify getting the 11 though, especially when you think about long term use. As for other comparable Androids right now, I've spoken very highly of the Pixel 7 Pro in previous videos, and that's actually a great phone to go side by side with this. It too undercuts the competition in price, but offers a superior camera, better water resistance, and a cleaner Android experience. 
On the other hand, the OnePlus 11 is faster, more powerful, and has a longer lasting battery. Again, those things point towards better long-term use as well, especially with OnePlus's greater software support. So for those of you looking for a new smartphone, I wanted to make sure the OnePlus 11 was on your radar this year. But let me know in the comments what you think about this phone. Tell me why you're getting it, or what it is that's stopping you. If you found this video helpful, then please give it a like, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when new videos go live. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.